Hello and welcome to another edition of Behind the Bearcat. This is the podcast where the Northwest Career Services team chats with Northwest faculty, staff, and students about their career paths, advice for students, and to find out how they became Bearcats. I'm Northwest Career Services Internship Coordinator Travis Klein. And I'm Hannah Christian, the Assistant Director of Career Services. And today we are joined by Stephen Chappell, who is the Director of Student Media and an instructor in the School of Communication and Mass Media at Northwest. Thanks How are you guys Welcome. Today. Thank We're you. We're good. All right. <laughs> Hannah usually kicks off with her famous first question. So, First job you ever had. Not paid by your parents, right? Correct. I knew that question already because I've listened to every episode. All right. My first job was at the Birmingham News. Really? Yeah. Like just jumped right in there from the very beginning. Even before I was technically old enough to work there, they had an ad in the paper for a new program they were starting up called the Teen Board, which was going to be a group of teenagers from the Birmingham area who are going to produce a special section of the paper once a month that was just for teenagers to read. Wow. And so at 14 years old, I applied and got selected. And so how did you, did you, did you see it in the paper? How did you hear about yeah, it? Yeah, I saw how it in you, the paper. You were already I, I was, interested in that type of thing at the age of 14? <laughs> at, in third grade, my third grade teacher, Chiquita Marbury, would bring me the newspaper every day to read in class because she knew I was so big into the news. <laughs> and then she would have me summarize it for the rest of the students. Wow. So. That's amazing. <laughs> that may be like the the most, the earliest uh, career sort of inclination that mm-hmm. we've interviewed, I think, thus far, right? Like, And to be confident enough in your writing skills at age yeah. 14 to want to write for the paper. Yeah, I, I've always loved to write. It's never been something that intimidated me, unlike it seems to intimidate a lot of today's students. Yes, it does. But it it was something I've just always had a passion for and loved doing it from the get-go. And within six months of starting on the team board, I was asked to work on the copy desk at the Birmingham News one day a week and had to explain to them I wasn't technically old enough to do it, <laughs> and they did not care. So I wow. started going in on Saturdays and helping edit special sections of the paper that were going to come out later in the week. Okay, so did you stay with the Birmingham News like through high school? Did you, did you just kind of continue and grow with that? I, I worked for them in some capacity all the way through high school and through most of my college career. And um, at one point in college, I was working there part-time, working at a small weekly newspaper, sort of part-time, but more like full-time as their sports editor, also working as an editor on the student newspaper wow. and supposedly going to classes, but not really. <laughs> So what did you, what other things in high school? So, so you're working, right? You're doing the Birmingham news thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Did you have other jobs in high school as well? Or Mm -hmm. were you really focused on that news aspect? The only paid job I had in high school was working at the newspaper. Um, I was involved in a lot of high school activities, but none of them were journalism. Well, I was on the yearbook. We didn't have a newspaper at my high school, but we had a yearbook. And I worked on the yearbook staff. But I was also in the marching band and in the concert band and on the scholars bowl team and on the math team. So, gotcha. So you were busy. I was busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So high schooling, newspaper writing. I'm assuming that you had already, since you'd been doing this since you know you were 14, you were like, oh, I think I'm going to go to college. And I'm. Did you study journalism? Is that what your degree is in? My degree is in journalism. That was. I walked in the door knowing exactly what I wanted to do and left with that degree. I never changed majors once. Huh. Started day one with that. I worked for the student newspaper. All. For three and a half years, I was in college. I finished in three and a half instead of four. So got out a little early. And, you know, I was on staff all the time. And at UAB, um, where I went, the newspaper printed year-round. So we had a summer publication as well. And so I was on it 365 year days a year. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it, it, you know, it sounds like you were super focused on, on newspaper and being a journalist. How did that transition to teaching journalism? So is teaching something you've always been interested in? Did you kind of stumble into it? We've heard kind of both sides from faculty. It was definitely a stumble into it type of thing. Um, I was uh, working full. I had taken over the job as editor-in-chief of the Leeds News, which was the weekly newspaper outside of Birmingham. And while I was doing that, I got a call from the then- vice president for student affairs at UAB, where I had just graduated from like a year before. And she said, your advisor 
um, just quit. Your student newspaper advisor just quit unexpectedly in the middle of the semester, and we're desperate for somebody to come in and do it, and I thought of you. Can you come in like once or twice a week and just guide the student newspaper each week kind of as a pseudo advisor because you were a really great editor. I trust you. You were also already working full time at publications while you're in newspapers yeah. while you were here. And you're someone I think can do the job as on a part time basis until we have time to advertise, find a replacement and get somebody in. And I said, sure, I'll do that. And went in and was there about a month when she said, please apply for this job full time. <laughs> we would like to hire you to be the student newspaper advisor. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'd kind of enjoy working at the paper, but I'd like to do this too. And if I'm at the paper though, I'm there until 2 a.m. I have to be back at 6 a.m. sometimes for something else. This is eight to five kind of. So I'll do that. And then the advisor job there was in student affairs, not in academic affairs, but they usually had the newspaper advisor adjunct instruct a reporting class every semester. So I had started adjunct instructing. And right at the very beginning. Right at the very the beginning. the newspaper director. And fell in love with it. And so instead of staying in the newspaper industry, which then seemed like a bad idea, but now seems like a great idea. <laughs> because at the time, the Birmingham News, which was where I was still doing some part-time work for them, even while I was working at the Leeds News Weekly, they had about 350 people working in editorial, and now they have about 15. Wow. So, you know, the downsizing of that, industry has really been devastating for career print people in particular, which Mm -hmm. is what I would have been because I would have, you know, I came out of college never having touched a microphone or a video camera because it was a print focused degree program. Hmm. And if you wanted to do broadcast, that was in a separate department. It wasn't even in the same department as the print program. So I did not have that multimedia training as a student But I had to develop that as an advisor as the industry started to evolve. So I've gone back and taken courses, and I've gone back and done workshops and training seminars to learn how to do video editing and audio editing and be a multimedia journalist, even though I don't practice it in the profession, I still have the skills to be able to teach it to the students. What was your favorite when you first jumped in, right, as a kid, and you're just like, I want to do this, I like to write the the copy editing, what was your favorite part to write or did you like doing the sports did you like doing um opinion editing or what 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 did you enjoy the most like right from the but like initially. interviewing really? interviewing people because really? you got to meet somebody new every day and learn something new and for me that was just the most exciting part of doing the job was always meeting new people and doing something new and doing something fun a, a story i one of my favorite first stories that I did that you could not do today because this item no longer exists was I was told, hey, here's the phone book. Find people <laughs> with famous names in the phone book and interview them about what their lives are like having that famous name. Huh. Today you don't have a phone book to right. come through and find those names. <laughs> and then, you know, that was I just flipped through and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to even make it more fun. I'm not just going to look for famous names. I'm going to look for people who have the names of superheroes. So here's a Diana (laughs) Prince and here's a Clark Kent. And and those are the people I called to interview and they loved it. It was really cool. And you know, some of them even let me come to their homes and take pictures of them. Mm -hmm. There was a guy whose name was Bruce Wayne who had a whole room (laughs) devoted to Batman and people, he would tell people I'm really Batman, you know, that's, that's who I am. And you know, that was the coolest interview I've ever done, I think still to this day, because here's this guy who was born, his parents named him Bruce Wayne. His parents swore they had no idea that was a comic book character, <laughs> and then he just embraced it and ran with it his whole life. So when you when you graduated college, before you came back to be the uh, advisor, getting that first newspaper job, obviously you'd had a newspaper job pretty much all the way through college, right? You've been you've do, been doing it for your education as well as like working at a paper. How was that job search process different for you than it was for a lot of your peers? <laughs> I never did one. Um, <laughs> that was kind of how it all came about. And in many respects, it's still true today in media. It's and for every job, I, you both of you, I know, say this all the time. It's not just what you know; it's who you know. Mm-hmm. Correct. And you have to network, and you have to know people, and you have to be able to get yourself ingrained into that person's mindset that, hey, if I need this job done, that would be a good person to call. And that's just kind of how it worked for me. I 
started on the teen board. That was my first real and only application to do anything. And you just had to write an essay of why you wanted to work for, for the paper and work on this project. And the, the person at the Birmingham News who hired me then, her name is Lynn Edge Reeves. Um, she's still a mentor today. And that's 35 years later. That's incredible. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I am still in touch with her all the time. And um, we are friends on Facebook. We communicate a lot. She gives, still gives me career advice. I still draw on her and her husband. Both of them worked at the Birmingham News. I help run a journalism contest, the Missouri College Media Association newspaper contest every year. And she and her husband judge a lot of entries <laughs> for me. And she was the reason I started working at the Birmingham News and then she knew someone who worked at the Leeds News when they were looking for a sports person to work part-time and cover high school sports and recommended me for the job. She said, you should call him. And they called me, and I just started writing sports for them. And then I got hired on part-time as the sports editor. And then while I was working there part-time as a sports editor, the editor-in-chief quit to take another job, and the publisher of the paper just said, it's your job if you want it. I don't want to <laughs> interview anybody. And then... I became editor-in-chief, and then I said, what about a sports editor? And he said, that's your problem. And I had to hire my own sports <laughs> editor, and I was still in college when all of that happened. So it you know, just kind of falls in your lap, and you don't expect it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good – it's always good for students to hear that because I, I know students and or people who may be looking for a job who aren't students. It's easy to say that in retrospect, right, to look back and to say, well, I just made – friends or I was I had a good reputation I did good work but when you're looking forward sometimes it's it's not so easy to see that so I think it's always good for us to hear those things and hear those stories that people have to share so where'd you go so you went back student mm -hmm. media advisor where'd you go from there well I stayed at UAB for five years doing that role while I was there I met my wife and got married and an opportunity arose for me to become the news editor of the Columbia Missourian in Columbia, Missouri. And I looked at that and I said, ooh, I, that would be an opportunity to go there, get that job, get a PhD to become a full-time teacher. And I, that was probably that's only maybe the only other job I've ever applied for where I didn't really know anybody there but got the position anyway. And Had you thought about getting a PhD before or did that kind of come up as you were working in higher kinda ed? It kind of came up as I was working in higher ed. So went to Mizzou as news editor of the Columbia Missourian, which was a teaching job at the at the school. They have a kind of a unique teaching situation mm -hmm. there where they have PhDs in the classroom, but then they have full time professionals in the what they call the teaching newsroom of the Columbia Missourian, which is a full time daily newspaper with full time editors, but everyone under the editors are students in the J school. So instead of a student newspaper there, they have a professional newspaper where the students are essentially slave labor. <laughs> and the the job was great. I was all set to get a PhD, and then my wife got pregnant, and things took a turn. And instead of getting a PhD, I just wound up staying there as a teaching editor. Then took a job. Didn't like that job as much as I thought I would. It wasn't really what I wanted to do. and But a teaching position that didn't require a PhD at the Truman State University came open. So I went to Truman State and was advising their student media there, went back into advising again after three years at Mizzou, not advising, advised the student newspaper, taught full-time as an instructor there, journalism classes. Then both of my parents who lived in Birmingham still were very ill, and I started making 12-hour one-way trips every other weekend to Birmingham. <laughs> Yeah. So it was 24 hour round trip drive every now, you know, once or twice a month to take care of them. And I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and part of being a college media advisor is you're, if you're really good, want to be really good at your job, you join College Media Association, which is an organization of college media advisors. Because one thing that makes us unique is we're usually the only person on our campuses that does Do that. our job yep. mm -hmm. and even yeah. understands what it is. So it's a very good organization for training you up and helping train your students. And they have annual conferences and you meet advisors from all over the world. And I had met the advisor at Middle Tennessee State University and we had become really close and she was leaving her position and she recommended, I, she said, I know your parents are sick and you're driving 12 hours. How about only driving three? My job <laughs> is open. And so I applied for her position and got it mm -hmm. and moved to Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And within a year of taking that position, both of my parents passed away. 
and stayed there another two years. And then that was when the funding crisis hit nationwide, Mm -hmm. but particularly started hurting higher education. And the state of Tennessee said, hey, we're going to cut all higher education budget 60 percent, figure it out. Middle Tennessee state said you can take a everybody here can choose to take a buyout and walk out the door or you can risk getting laid off on June 30th. But we have to cut $60 million out of our budget. So Mm -hmm. it's your choice. And so I said, I'm going to take the buyout and start applying for other jobs and see what I can find. And so I took the buyout because it included, it would have gave me a two year grace period if I versus getting laid off and not getting nothing. So I went ahead and took that (laughs) to hedge my bets. Within three months, six media jobs came open. I applied for all six, got offered five, was about to accept one when a friend of mine in college media advising called me and said, (laughs) I need to hire a new media advisor. I understand you're looking. Would you be interested? And I said, well, sure. I'd love to work with you. And he said, well, here's the job. Here's what it pays. Here's when it starts. Are you interested? And I said, yeah. And he goes, then it's yours. And I'm like, what? (laughs) And he said, I'm a private college. I don't have to do anything that anybody else does. If you want the job, you're hired. And I said, well, I'd still like to take a look at the Mm -hmm. campus and see everything. So I It was Simpson College in Indianola, Iowa. And so I flew up there, pretended to do kind of an on-site interview, but he had already said, it's your job. There's no one else we're applying that we're hiring. And so he hired me. We left Murfreesboro and went to Indianola. And at the end of two years at Indianola was when Laura Whitmer, who had been here for 29 years, (laughs) retired from this job. And she called me and she said, I'm leaving Northwest and I want you to apply for my job. I've already highly recommended you to everybody at Northwest. (laughs) So you have to apply. Because then I look like a fool if you don't. So I applied for the job here and got offered the job here and have been here ever since. And really, this is probably one of the three best jobs in college media. The support Northwest gives student media here is... It's incredible. Incredible. I mean, we're one of three schools in the country with a media truck. And the other two schools have multi-million dollar journalism budgets. Ours is nowhere near that. So, you know, the fact that we have a tool like that at our disposal is just unbelievable. The fact that we have a podcast studio is unbelievable. Yeah. We appreciate it very yeah. much. Yeah, I mean, I know student newspapers that are doing their podcasts sitting at the news in their newsroom mm-hmm. just on their iPhones. So the fact that we're sitting at a, you know, beautiful table with four beautiful microphones and a padded room and everything is mm-hmm. perfect is is a resource that most student media don't have. Mm-hmm. And, you know, th- this is a great job and I love it. <laughs> One of the things, when Brian was on here, Brian Swafford, we talked a lot about the national championships that the speech team has won. So I want to give you an opportunity to do that with student <laughs> media because I know both newspaper and yearbook have been multi-award winners, not at the state level even, but at the national level. So I want to get yep. you the opportunity to brag on, on your kids a little bit too, <laughs> just like he did. We do really, really well in the media competitions. Um, as I was saying earlier, I run the state media, help run the state media competition and we do very well at that every year, not because I help run it, because I don't have anything to do with our division. You have multiple divisions based on school size. And the yearbook usually wins 70 to 80 percent of all the state awards, sometimes more. In fact, we had one year f- six years ago where we won first, second and third place in all 17 categories for yearbook. So, you know, our yearbook does exceptionally well. And the student newspaper does really well as well at state. We come back with 30 or 40 awards every year from the state competition. And then we just came back, uh, well, in uh, November, we came back from the fall national media convention and the newspaper placed in uh, fifth place and best to show there. So, and that's fifth place out of all the newspapers that are at that. Not, they don't break you down really by, by size or, by size or school. Anything. They do divide you between daily newspaper and weekly newspaper, but they don't separate you by size. So you may be a weekly, but there's a lot of schools that used to be dailies that are now that weeklies, in, you know, now because they're suffering as well. So there's schools like 20 times our size that we're competing against now in that same category. So I feel like a fifth place when the four schools that beat us all have budgets of 20 million and a staff of 150 <laughs> versus a staff of 40. that We did really well. Yeah. So. And then both the newspaper and the, we're one of a handful of schools where both print publications are in the Hall of Fame for Associated Collegiate Press. So a newspaper and yearbook were both two of the first schools to be given that honor by Associated Collegiate Press. And it's based on the honors you've won leading Mm. up to that. So it's nice to go to the Associated Collegiate Press conventions and look at their giant plaque on the Hall of Fame and you see Tower Yearbook on the yearbook plaque and 
Northwest Missouri and on the newspaper plaque, and then you start looking for other schools, and there's only one school on, you know, oh, they're not on both plaques. They're only mm-hmm. on one. So. And what do you attribute that success to? Is it, Do you think the size of Northwest helps because students can be a little more nimble? or what? I think there's a lot of factors that have contributed to that over the years. I mean, it started a long time ago. We've had continued sustained success, mm-hmm. and part of that has we, we've always hired good people. We've had good journalism instructors throughout the, the School of Communication and Mass Media. We've had strong advisors. It, we've not had many, actually. I'm only the sixth advisor Continuity. in the 110-year history of the student newspaper. That's so, incredible right um, there. Well, Laura Widmer was here 29 of those years. And so, yeah, there's been a lot of continuity, which, which has helped tremendously with that success. One of the things that I think contributes greatly to our success is the fact that we don't really have any other local media to compete against. Yes, there's another weekly newspaper in town and what used to be a daily, but now a weekly newspaper in town. But it's not like we're competing against a Kansas City star for advertising dollars or for eyeballs. And our students go out and they cover the Maryville community just like they cover the campus community. And that is an advantage to them in two ways. One, it gives them those clips that let them show potential hires, which is why we have so many Northwest media graduates doing great work around the country, that they can do more than just cover their campus. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it gives them much more broad-based exposure, and students want to come here because they're going to do more than just cover their school. They're like, oh, wow, they cover the city council and they cover high school sports and they travel and they don't just, and that's another thing that helps us that hurts a lot of schools and why students will come here to do journalism. I could go to Mizzou, but they don't let their students travel. They just stay on campus, but look at Northwest. They go to every home, every football game, road and home. Oh, and they get to cover national championships every (laughs) year in some sport. So, and they're traveling to that and that's additional exposure that other students don't get at other schools. And so One of the reasons why we launched a sports media major a few years ago is the success of our athletics program was drawing journalism students here to cover sports. And, you know, that's a big advantage for us as well. And one one thing, too, students can start earlier in their careers, too. They don't have to wait until they're a junior or senior and they're accepted in the J school. They can be on the yearbook first semester. They get right in first day. Yes, and we have freshmen on both the newspaper and yearbook staffs every year. Um, sometimes those freshmen are so good that by their sophomore year, they're in charge of the publication. <laughs> um, I've had multiple sophomore editors in chief in my eight years here. So it's, you know, not unheard of. It's fairly common for that to happen. And many times those students are coming from very strong high school journalism programs, which give them a leg up coming in. But still, it's unheard of at most colleges for a sophomore to be the editor in chief of anything. Absolutely. So one thing we like, we like to have advice for students, and I know you have lots of advice for students, but one thing I hear a lot from journalism and mass media students is they have a hard time sometimes finding jobs because there, there, there aren't a huge amount of them and they're, they're getting smaller every day, seems like, and then they're really competitive. So what advice do you have for students to stand out? You know, if they're thinking about possibly a journalism major, how do they make the most out of their time here to get that awesome job? They have to work their butts off. I mean, that's the simple line. They have to work their butts off. They can't just expect things to be handed to them. One of the things that annoys me more than anything is a student who comes to me and says, I can't get an interview. Nobody will hire me. And I said, how many semesters did you work in student media? Well, I had to do three hours of practicum, so I did two semesters. And that's all you did? Yeah. If you had worked on student media all four years here, you'd have a much better portfolio that would lead you to a better job opportunity. This is kind of your fault. And then I tell them, even though we don't require internships, you should be doing not just one internship, but multiple internships before you graduate. A, that builds your portfolio and gains experience, but it also gets you references. Builds you that network. Yes, and you've got to have that professional network when you walk out the door if you want to be hired. But then the second thing that I, I, I'm constantly hammering into students is quit thinking you're going to get a job in your hometown. You've got to be willing to pack a suitcase and move somewhere else, especially for that first job. Because most of your hometowns don't have any media to hire you anyway. <laughs> and even if they did, do you want to work there for $20,000 a year or go somewhere else where you might make forty? You have to think about that as well. One of the things that does pain me a lot is looking at these small town weeklies that are hiring students right out of college. And their salary range is twenty to $25,000. That's still the poverty level. Mm-hmm. So don't do that job. Be willing to move away and explore and Take a chance, and and you might find out that you're stronger than you think you are. 
And that only helps when you talk about building your network. If you're going back to your hometown, you're, you're going back somewhere that you know, you know, minimum 75% of the people, right? When you go mm-hmm. somewhere new, what opportunity awaits you there to build a new network, to have another, as you just demonstrated with your own story, to have another place that just opens up more opportunities for you in the future. Right. And the journalism field, like every field, I think, is its own community. And one of the things I remind my students are constantly reminded because I just (laughs) show it to them is that it doesn't matter where they're going in the country. I probably know someone there. I can help make that connection even if they don't have one of their own because I have alumni. I've been teaching and advising now for 27 years. I have alumni everywhere. I have contacts everywhere. There's not a college media advisor in this country I have not met because of College Media Association. And I'm now on the board of directors of CMA, so I know everybody <laughs> in CMA. And it's, you know, those kind of connections are something you have to take advantage of if you want to be employed and be employable. Another thing I, I wanted to, we're getting close to time, and I don't want to keep you extra time, but you, you also do NACTIVE, which is something that is, is unique to Northwest. I want you to talk about that because I think that's a really great opportunity that not all students know about out there. I'm always amazed at how many students don't know that NACTIVE exists, yep. given how much of a public face we seem to put on with that class. Mm-hmm. But it's essentially, it's an interactive digital media advertising agency that is also a class for which you can get three hours of credit. You have to apply to be in the class. You're applying like you're applying for a real world job. The class has eight jobs. There's eight positions that you're applying for, and there's four of each position. So we have four teams in the class that are working for a real-world client doing a real-world agency media plan for over the course of the semester. The end of the semester, the students do a professional pitch to the client with their solution to the client's real-world problem. And then at the end of that, it's kind of like the TV show The Pitch that NBC (laughs) used to have. And at the end of that pitch, the client selects a winner and says, this is what we're going to do. And so one team walks away feeling really, really good, and the other teams walk away feeling, oh, but... For it doesn't matter whether you're on the winning team or on you're one of the other teams. You're all doing the real world work of, of building up that. Yes. You, you leave that class with a huge portfolio piece. You leave that class with professional contacts because it's, there's four faculty who co-teach the course. But we also bring in anywhere from six to 15 agency professionals every semester to do guest lectures and give feedback on the student work because we want them to... A, make those contacts with the professionals. The professionals, by the way, love our class. Practically every ad agency in Kansas City and Omaha, one of the first things they look for on a Northwest student resume when they apply is, did they do NACTIV? Because they know they've had at least one semester of real-world agency experience. And those agency professionals will come in and at least do a lecture, if not sit down and critique what they're doing for the client and give them feedback on their, their work for the client and lead them in the right direction. We try to find professionals who have worked on clients similar to our client. So this semester, um, it's an ad, it's a insurance agency. So we're looking for some advertising professionals this semester to speak who have worked on agencies similar to this one because every one of those is different. Every client is different. What you have to do for those clients is is extremely different. And you know sometimes you have a client this this semester it's not away mutual insurance. That's not a sexy sounding client, but that's the kind of client you're going to have to work at at a real world agency. So it mm-hmm. doesn't really matter how famous or well known or popular the client may be for the real world agencies looking to hire our students. It's did you get that experience producing an actual campaign, working in an interdisciplinary environment because our students come from a variety of majors in this class. It's not just advertising students. That was going to be my question. Do you require them to be a specific major? Can they, can I be, can I take part if I'm not a a business major or an advertising major or a? Yes. It's open to any student at Northwest from any degree program. You just have to have some experience in that area that we're hiring you for. So the eight positions are project manager, which is the team lead for each of the four teams. And then there's a strategic planner. There's a multi-platform content creator, which is our sexy name that for sounds fancy. copywriter. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's the person who's writing the content for all the different platforms that might be used by the client. 
Then there's a media manager who handles the advertising component and the, the cost of that, a public relations manager, an interactive digital media manager, which usually comes from computer science because there's going to be some coding involved mm -hmm. with that that particular one because they're usually going to be working website on things. website or app development or something like that for the client. And then there's an art director and a graphic designer. So those are our eight positions. And each student hired for that has to exhibit some kind of skill set in their resume that applies to that position. But it doesn't mean that the, the strategic planner usually comes from marketing, but you don't have to come from marketing. The media manager usually comes from advertising, but Not she doesn't have to come from advertising. The art director and graphic designer usually come from uh, digital media art or from art, but doesn't have to come from digital media art or art. So they can come from pretty much any major on campus. They just have to have demonstrated experience and knowledge of that particular area that they're applying for. So where, if I'm a student and I just listened to this podcast and I got all excited about this because I think, oh, I want to take part in active, where do I apply for that position at? How do I, how do I apply for that? The class is every spring. The applications are early every fall, typically September 17th or around September 17th is the deadline to apply. And we will put up posters all over campus. We send emails to students who are eligible. We do not encourage freshmen or sophomores typically to apply for this course. So juniors and seniors who are in programs, if you're in an academic program that we're specifically suited for, you'll get an, an email app inviting you to apply. Um, it'll be on Canvas. There'll be a Canvas ad gotcha. notifying students that you can now apply for the class. And then, of course, we send the four of us who teach in it encourage all of our colleagues in our own schools and departments to make announcements in all their classes. Because you're applying for a class and not a job, we can't put it on right. the HR website because you're not <laughs> getting paid for this. You're getting college credit for it. So it's just, you know, the student has to be aware that it's there and then apply for it through that. But every fall, every September is when we're accepting applications. And then we usually have interviews for the positions the week after the deadline and then notify everyone who's been selected for the class the week after that. So we want everyone to know about the course before they start registration for the spring for the semester. Spring. I gotcha. Because even though it's a three credit hour class, it meets six hours a week. So it's a lot of extra work. Mm -hmm. And the class meeting is structured that way. We do essentially the first hour, we meet Monday, Wednesday, Friday from one to three. And the first hour is the class lecture, instructional time, and then the second hour is for each project team to have a set meeting time because for eight students from eight different majors to be able to find a, an hour, a time to, a meet, time to meet each week <laughs> that they're all free is almost impossible. So if we build that into the course, then it's set for them. Gotcha. So then they have, and we have a, we have rooms allotted for them that they have access to 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the entire semester. So they can meet anytime they want to outside of that time frame, but they have a, special room set aside for them that they can meet in for the whole semester to work on their project. It almost sounds like a student has to be willfully ignoring it, not to get information about it. <laughs> That's what I feel like. But, you know, as director of student media, I'm in the Missouri newsroom all the time. I put up posters in the newsroom and even tell my students in the newsroom to apply for this. And every year after the application ends, some student in the newsroom will come up to me and say, Hey, I just heard about an active. Should I have applied or should I apply? And I said, well, the deadline was three weeks ago and we've already interviewed everybody. How did you not see that poster for two months? <laughs> and they just shrug their shoulders and walk away. And I've, I'm always amazed that those students exist. They, you know, somehow there's a poster and this once it's been three or four years ago, that poster was on the pole in the newsroom right above her desk where she sat every day. And she said, I never saw the poster. And I'm like, it was, look straight up. She goes, I never look up there. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So the advice of the day is look up there. Yeah, look up there. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Any other questions, Anna? I think I'm good. All right. Thank you so much, Thank Steve. you we so much it. for joining us. Thanks joining for having us me. Today. Absolutely. All right. Well, that'll do it for another Behind the Bearcat. And we will talk to you next time. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed that episode. Don't forget to follow on your podcast platform of choice and on YouTube. Also click the little notification bell on YouTube so you never miss an upload. And you can follow us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and we have a LinkedIn page.